there is an adversarial goal here. If you increase the limit, you have a potential profit from the person using their credit limit. But you have a very real, immediate hit to your provisions. So now, we needed some sort of modeling that didn't just gave us whether to increase or not, but also gave us the optimal value that we should increase you. We don't just give you a limit increase. We give you the one that minimizes the value at risk and also the one that has unexpected value, a profitable margin, and te la duda abstand. If you are in doubt, don't do it. We were giving increases to more people than before, surprisingly, but we were giving much more conservative and reasonable increases than what other competing policies would probably be able to offer. My career started in credit cards, so the quest to find the ideal credit limit strategy is one that I know well, and it's one that I've enjoyed. And then when I moved into the credit bureau space, I had the chance to take a bird's eye view of the landscape, and the challenge became even more fascinating. If lender A gives a customer of theirs a credit limit increase, sure, they can see on their side if marginal spend increases. But what happens to the spend that same customer has at Lender B in that month and the next month and the month after? And what happens when Lender B reacts? Who is left better off and was it all worth it? More importantly, asks our friend Werner Heisenberg, at what point do our attempts to measure the customer's behavior impact that behavior too much? Or at what point does the customer become so tempted with high limits that they start on a spending path that they can't come back from. I've referenced one scientific concept I barely understand already, so why not another? It's like fractals. The closer we look at this, the more complex it all becomes. Welcome to How to Lend Money to Strangers with Brendan LaGrange. Dr. Christian Bravo, welcome to the show. You are the Associate Professor and Canada Research Chair in Banking and Insurance Analytics at Western University in Ontario, Canada. You've gone from Chile, you've worked in, in Belgium, in Canada, around the world experience in, in banking topics. So talk to me about your experience, your background, path you've walked to, to where you are today. I am an industrial engineer. I have a master's in operational research. And after I finished my master's, I worked at the marketing area of a bank for a couple of years before deciding that actually I, I, I liked a lot more research than I liked being in an office in meetings. So I decided to take a PhD co-supervised between the University of Chile and the University of Southampton in the UK with Professor Lynn Thomas, who is one of the main founders of Modern Great Risk, who sadly passed away many years ago. I finished that. I went to take a postdoc, as you said, at, at Belgium with uh, Professor Val Bassens. I worked there for a year, if I recall correctly. And then I took a first position back home in Chile. And very soon, Southampton University itself offered me a position. So I was a professor there for four years before the Canadian government with Western University offered me the Canada Research Chair. So I feel very fortunate because I've been able to see the banking reality across the world. So from a highly sophisticated regulatory environment such as Europe to the Canadian system that exists halfway between the American and the European and really trying to see how they balance both out to a developing country that was back then only in Basel 1. Point, they call it 1.7, right? And that has allowed me to have the banking analytics lab, if I may have a plug there. The website is dvil.ai, where we have now a, a large group. We have six presentations here at the Great Scoring Conference. I always thought that credit analytics or banking analytics was a very niche topic, but more and more I'm seeing there's actually lots of good schools doing good work. As you said, Christian, you've got was it six papers being delivered by your team here. It was one of the hardest things to to find the time with you because there was always something happening. But I'm going to focus just on optimizing credit limit adjustment under adversarial goals using causal learning. Now, I've done a number of consulting projects where we've looked at credit limit management and what is the right approach and when do we need to do credit limit increases? Can we do credit limit decreases? But your paper includes terms like causal learning, an umbrella of supervised learning, tailor-like expansion procedures, 
all sorts of big words that I don't understand myself. So let's start with some basic building blocks there. You looked at data from a super app in Latin America for your credit limit data. What were you looking at? What sort of uh, limits are we talking about here? And then we can dive into what you, you learned. The specific technical details of the company cannot really share that much due to, due, due to the, the confidentiality. But what I can tell you is that the way it works, you get a credit card with a low limit, very low limit. And then if you really want to become profitable, you have to very aggressively start increasing the great limits. Very aggressively. Uh, low and grow. Exactly. The, the, what's called the, the high volume, low amount strategy, right? Uh, spearheaded by Capital One that became the largest credit card provider in the US following that strategy. The thing is, how do you actually increase the credit limit in a way that makes sense? We first did it in a more supervised way, let's say, and that's a paper that's already a preprint out there that you can look for. But we realized that that one was easy because we use a fixed limit increase. So we were saying, Christian, I'm going to increase 20% every time that I increase you and the decision becomes binary, yes or no. That's easy from a supervised point of view. But reality doesn't work like that, especially in these high growth strategies. We can increase the limit by as much as we want, right? All the way up to 300% we had people in the database. So the question is, how do you decide the optimal amount? So we needed some sort of modeling that didn't just gave us whether to increase or not, but also gave us the optimal value that we should increase you in percentage terms against your original balance, right? And I'm going to start dissecting a little bit the title because there is an adversarial goal here. If you increase the limit, what will happen is you have a potential predicted, expected profit from the person using their credit limit. But you have a very real immediate hit to your provisions, to your expected loss, right? Just by increasing the limit, you're going to immediately take a provision hit. And most papers we found out only focus on the revenue side. So what we said, we had these two adversarial goals, the profit and the provisions, the very real hit to provisions that pretty much had been neglected, given that limit uh, was taken more as a marketing problem rather than a risk management problem. So we mixed the two of those into this model. Talk about the, the provisions, you know, capital is expensive again, and we do need to really think, are we just giving limits that of doing no benefit. And of course, in the loss terms, but in the human terms as well, we know that for that person who's going into default, it's that extra runway that they can build up before they maybe acknowledge the problem, before they have to acknowledge the problem. And we know people don't want to phone a bank and admit if they're in trouble, or maybe they don't want to admit to themselves they're in trouble. That runway, they can then hit extra few hundred pounds that they owe you know, when they can't avoid it, but now they can't afford it. So these are real issues here. It's not just increase the limit and see what happens. So I'm really happy to hear that you are looking at it carefully. And I think that I underline that point you raised. Like before we would just, as I said, you'd increase the limit and we see how much marginal utilization goes up and does it go up? Okay, great. And we carry on and we left it at that. And so, yeah, I'm interested to see what you picked up there as you started to get into, into the details. There's also a second thing that's uh, an unintended consequence of these low value, high growth strategies is that utilization is one of the major factors in people's credit scores, right? And if your limit is 200 quid, you're going to hit it every month. So for a while, you're going to take a reasonable hit to your credit scores. So an increase is something that people should consider even if they don't need it because it will lower their utilizations. We want to keep them below 35%, give or take. So having a higher limit is something desirable in general, as long as you're not going to go over burden. So you have on the one side, the group of people that want the higher limit increase so they have a lower utilization. And on the other, the ones that need the extra runway in the case of an emergency. So those two things come into account from the person's point of view. In fact, the main thing that we saw is that there were three behaviors here that were pretty clear. You have the people that got the credit card and put it in a drawer, never use it, and just accepted every potential credit limit increase. That came at a huge provision cost for no profit. We have the group of people that use it and paid it in full at the end of the month. 
those were great because the charges that the customers pay using a credit card were enough to fund this balance between the two. So you normally want that, right? And you had the third group that was the ones that any limit that you gave them immediately, they started using it. And those came normally with a pretty high provision cost. So that was the balance of the modeling part. You needed to predict which group of customers you were in. Now, the value of the increase, and I think that was our biggest innovation. Actually, causal learning for credit limit was proposed by Gerald Fanner, who's outside probably walking around 11 years, 12 years ago. However, that was more of a position paper saying it may be cool. Yeah. Our biggest innovation is that we probably brought it to real life, right? To something that was actionable. And the way that we did is that the causal model will give you a probability distribution of what will be the best value. In traditional causal learning, you will just take the average of that distribution and just pick the biggest value. That's not enough. Because what really brings losses in credit limit increases is the fact that if someone defaults, that default is going to eat 10 profitable customers. Yeah. So the extreme value, what we call in finance, the value at risk was actually the key point here. So we propose a way of studying and analyzing the distribution of losses, given the distribution of probability that we get from causal learning, to give you the one that had the lowest value at risk. And that will give you the highest expected profit, even in the face of black swan events. And with that, we were able to create a system that beat the predictive system that we ourselves have built a, a year ago beat the policy that the company had by a significant margin. We were getting 20%, 30% per customer increase in profit over their, their own decisions. Yeah. And that's why I showed yesterday in my talk. Also, and this became fun, we were able to extract ever so slightly more of the model when we try to use a predictive model now, but to predict the future consumption of the limit increase. And with that, given the limit increase, are you going to be profitable or not. So now, when we condition all three things, we don't just give you a limit increase. We give you the one that minimizes the value at risk and also the one that has unexpected value, a profitable margin. Only then we gave you an increase that makes sense. That meant that we were giving increases to more people than before, surprisingly. Yeah but we were given much more conservative and reasonable increases than what other competing policies will probably be able to offer. And that to me was the biggest innovation of our work. Whenever I do any talk on credit, the first thing I always mention is like risk is exponential. We often talk about averages, but you know, like 80% of people are less risky than average. It doesn't work in an average way. And you do need to apply this underlying thing that, yeah, the losses are not sort of evenly distributed through the population. One loss is 10 good people. And it's really great to hear that incorporated in and really interesting to hear that actually that little bit of whose marginal utilization is going to increase is very secondary actually to the, the actual profit calculation. You need to look at this value at risk. And I think the other thing before we get back to, to the actual, <laughs> your actual studies is that when I used to be in these conversations, we would look at credit limits in a lower and grow approach and we didn't have the analytical tools that exist today, but I don't think we applied much. It was more gut feel. And we said, well, maybe when the limit's too low, people don't bother because they don't want to hit a, a limit in the shop. So they just don't use the card. And we would do a very round number approach. So you say like 50% increase or double the thing, do it every six months. Whereas a smoother, more frequent, smaller increase is maybe, well, it has been shown to be the better approach the philosophy of low and grow is actually more what you're describing, right? Like each month we get a little bit more data, each month we get a little bit more certain, we get a bit more exposure. And yeah, it's great to hear that that's been borne out and that then there are these causal learning approaches to help that. So I'm going to take you a step back to causal learning because it's not, uh, you know, I'm not familiar really with all the details of this. So can you explain to me what causal learning is? Yeah, so um, I, I said just in my talk, Causality is the new explainability, right? So it's one step further for an explainability. You can explain how the predictions are made, but that will give you whether there are correlations that are meaningful. 
it will not really tell you whether those correlations imply a behavior, an underlying behavior. A causal learning model, first and foremost, is about controlling the data that goes into the model. There are many techniques, but honestly, you could do it with a linear regression. The important part is that the data that enters the model allows you to contrast different people with the same underlying characteristics, but were to whom different treatments have been made. Just like when you take a medicine, if, if a doctor of a, a pharmaceutical is testing a new medicine, what they will do is they will get a bunch of people with different characteristics and they will give them different doses of the medicine. You take different people with different characteristics and we give them different limit increases. But how do we know whether the medicine affect more women or people with a certain range of salary in our case of great limits, right? What we do is we take two people with similar income and we give them different limits and we see their behavior later. We call that propensity matching, and there are many other techniques that honestly are not really critical to the point. The important thing here is saying, when we are choosing the sample to train the model, first and foremost, we're going to choose a sample in which we can see all decisions being made, right, across the full spectrum of decisions. And the model will be able to tell us, you know what, for these people with these characteristics, it is actually this decision that was the most impactful. Yeah. When, when I started my career with Capital One, they're very big on test and learn. And we did a lot of experiment design. Did the yellow envelope, the blue envelope, or the white envelope get opened more often? And then did the 10%, the 15 or the 20% credit limit offer get responded to, to more often? But we had to think up front what our design of our thing would be, and we'd have to roll it out as a very like a whole project to get the test out. But now with the current techniques, it sounds like I don't need to have thought of everything up front. I don't need to do one test at a time and slowly build uh, up knowledge. I can look at the data and look at the various decisions that have been made by chance, by design, whatever they've reason was behind them in the past. That data can be looked at all together and say, okay, that happened here, that happened here, that happened here. This person got that, this person got that and identify that little nugget. That's the, the interaction that, that, that made the uptick. Yes. Yeah, so first, the tests that you conducted are still the gold standard. That is the best way of identifying causality using a random control experiment. And that won't change, right? However, when you either have a massive amount of data where you know this data has some randomness. So I knew that. I knew my data set had Around half of the increases have been given, given pretty much at random because the company had changed the policy across time. That's called a natural experiment, right? A semi-randomly controlled experiment. So I did have some very purposely designed increases and those I had to be very careful. And that's what I mean about causal learning, right? Is that you need to carefully control the data to create a quasi-random experiment that will allow you to get better conclusions. Okay. So. Still, if you have the ability to run control experiments, that is going to be better. And that will give you more confident results. However, the scale usually is not possible unless you're a fintech. Fintech allows you through the app to run some possibly faster and more appropriate experiments. And probably this is something that banks can learn a lot from. And I certainly been working with banks trying to do stuff like that. But in some cases, it's not practical. I'd imagine that for most organizations, Unless you've had the culture of experimental design and knowledge management for the last 10, 20 years, and you've kept that discipline, a manager's been in the team, they've had an approach, they've thought of something, they've moved off, somebody else has come, they've changed things. Most of us are sitting with data that is somewhat randomized because of the human nature of all our businesses. And your limit increase strategy is one of the most important strategies within a, a revolving lending business, right? You can get customers on board, but if they're not using the product, it's exposure to, to losses, exposure to fraud, it's cost to maintain it. If you get limit management right, that's half the battle. So what sort of uplift are we talking about? And I'm going to refer to the past study where we measure it a little bit better. So in, in this study, I measure it per customer. And per customer, we are looking at, on average, 
a profit increase per customer per quarter of around 20%, which sounds a lot, but it's actually when you see that the margin is um, 2.5%, we increase that to 3%, right? But it's still 20%. <laughs> it's a 20% margin, margin increase. Sadly, our collaboration with the company finished by the time we were going to, to run the randomized experience. So my suggestion is always use this to build it. And once you have it, always validate it with a randomized experiment. Yeah. That will be my way of being sure. But we're looking 15, at least to 20%. That was a surprise to us, you know? I was expecting it to be better, of course, right? Or was I wouldn't have tried it. But we got such a big increase. And I think that the reason is the black swans. We have a saying in Spanish, ante la duda, abstain. If you are in doubt, don't do it. Our model is a mathematical formulation of that. And what it does is it will say, I could increase maybe 60%. But you know what? 40% gives me almost the same expected profit at an incredibly reduced risk. It's a no-brainer. And this is just a pudding. These concepts are so natural in practice, in a way, that haven't really been thought before. And, I, and, and that's really the sort of research I've always liked, right? Trying to understand the system and taking this systemic view of what a financial institution is and putting it together in a way in which you get this overall view using these modern techniques that are out there now that really allows us to understand the world. Yeah, and I think that's just a fantastic illustration of, of what it's doing. Just We couldn't do that in the past. You say we would take an average. We do it is 20% better than 10%. We'll give everyone 20%. The thinking was done once off and it had to be done at scale for everybody. Whereas now, when we talk about the broader concept of artificial intelligence, this is more about the machine thinking for us on a one-by-one -one basis. So this in the data that the models are able to capture. And that's the important part. We use the same variables in the end, right? So we have the same things that you were describing, plus a whole bunch more. And we let the model decide which ones are relevant. And that's what the three methods usually causal for is. There are a whole bunch of techniques that are just extensions to this causal world that control the data, control the loss functions in a way that makes sense. So how we actually train the model is slightly different to take into account that we're looking at distributions now. We're looking at probabilities. We're not looking at fixed points. Once you have all of that, and there have been several advances in the last two or three years on that, what we really get is this decision-making that make financial sense, right? And if we had the time to go to full files with a, an analyst taking a look at files one by one, they would probably make the same decision as we are. But what we don't have is cost, right? That would be prohibitive. You will need an army of analysts. So we defaulted to the techniques that you were describing. And it speeds it up in a way that then humans can take a look and say, yes, this makes sense. Christian, I think everybody listening who's got a revolving product needs to have a think about how they do limit strategies because it is that driving thing. So if anybody does want to speak to you, want to see the work that you and the team are doing, remind us again where they can go to get involved, to, to contact you or to see some of this research. Yes, perfect. So the first thing I have to say is that this has been the amazing work of my PhD student, Charlie Alfonso Sanchez. Inco supervision with Christina Sandova. So this is, uh, I'm just the face here because she's on maternity leave. So she couldn't be presenting or otherwise you will be interviewing her. And um, you can find all the work that we do in our website, the Banking Analytics Lab. So it's the B-A-L dot A-I. And there, Shirley actually wrote a blog post about her paper where you can see a little bit more detail and the preprint of the work with the GitHub so you can play around with your own data if you have it. It's going to come out in about a month or so. I just am the one that hasn't finished reading it before it can be shown to the world. I'll put all those links in there. I think, um, as I said, it's, it's sort of mandatory reading for anybody to, to have a think. Even if they don't use the exact same approaches, just to rethink, are we still doing what we were doing 20 years ago? And is there a better way to do it? Half my research always ends up being, you know what? I should think about this differently. If you get those insights from my research, even if you don't implement the models, that sometimes they are too academic, and that is true. Sometimes they are not. But just thinking about these things differently are going to already bring you profitable solutions. And that has been my experience so far. Lovely. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you all for listening. Please do look for and follow the show 
on your favorite podcast platform and share the updates widely on LinkedIn, where lending nerds are found in our largest concentration. Plus, send me a connection request while you're there. This show is written and recorded by myself, Brendan LaGrange, in Brighton, England. Show music is by I Am Wake, and you can find show notes and written transcripts at www.howtolendmoneytostrangers.show or just www.htlmts.show, and I'll see you again next Thursday.